pick up their trail at the chopper, run them down, grab those hostages, and bounce back across the border before anybody knows we were there. Let's screw with the TV people. The problem was the heat, man. The heat's killer. I remember at times John just sitting on the ground with his head in his hands. Like, what the hell have I gotten myself into? For every shot, there's six, eight, ten passes of things. So this was our day. It was like 14 hours of work. It was a real boot camp. Pure hell. I got to go back 15 years and relive everything, except this time to enjoy it and not worry about having to die. Shooting those many bullets coming through that gun with that power, it was an amazing experience. They don't put this in acting class. They'd have a bigger dropout rate. If it bleeds, we can kill it. We had an idea about doing a story about a brotherhood of hunters who came from another planet to hunt all kinds of things, but we realized very quickly that wouldn't work very well, so we picked one hunter who was going to hunt the most dangerous species, which had to be man, and the most dangerous man was a combat soldier. It's one of those simple ideas that once someone has the idea, everyone else says, oh, why didn't we think of that? It was a spec script. Thomas Brothers, you know, two first-time writers at the time, Basically, couldn't get anybody to read the script, didn't have an agent, slipped it under a door of an executive, Michael Levy, at Fox. Michael read the script, shared it with me and the rest of us. Larry Gordon was head of the studio at the time, bought the script, okayed the script going out to Arnold Schwarzenegger. I went and got John McTiernan involved in the process. I had seen his picture. We needed a, a fresh voice. And um, Larry Gordon invited Joel Silver to come on and produce it. Joel was the hands-on producer on set. To this day, he still maintains an almost uh, overwhelming presence on the set. A lot of producers, they sort of sit back, they get a line producer, they serve as a sort of creative liaison between the studio and the film, but they don't get their hands dirty. Joel always has gotten his hands dirty by really getting into the muck of the film. Let's lock off this, get a hi-hat or something on that one. I was very happy when they offered it to me. I wanted to do an old-fashioned popcorn movie. And that's what this is. It's meant to be entertainment. And it comes at it from a direction that I had some experience in, which is out of suspense. John McTiernan is a really wonderful action director. He has an ability to take a script and infuse it with both a sense of energy but great storytelling. And so he's a really wonderful storyteller, which is really what you want in a director. John McTiernan has a tremendous ability to visualize the film in his head and just go get that film, not waste any time, not bullshit around. John McTiernan is an actor's director. It's not just some, you know, director who's just trying to make pretty pictures. It's he has a motivation for why this particular scene should be this way and what your character's motivation should be. He's very sure, very sure of himself. You guys are all around. I'm going to have to be careful the next couple of days, aren't I? I always wanted to do a film like The Wild Bunch or The Magnificent Seven or something like that where a team of guys work together and rather than relying just on yourself. And it's much more realistic. But each one of these guys are very powerful guys. They're not only just great actors, but they're physically very strong, they're very well experienced, and they're equals of mine. You son of a bitch. There are very few people who can be the counterweight to Arnold. What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils? Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. I wanted somebody very strong who's a good actor as well as being very physical. And there are very few people around you could consider once we got the list out it. Carl jumped right out. Yeah, I was uh, hanging out in that jungle called Hollywood, very much like this jungle here. Uh, went in one day into this office. It was very hot, steamy like today. You know, a lot of bugs crawling over you and that kind of stuff. Went to this producer's office. It was very air-conditioned. Saw this name outside. And, 
you know, neon light and a fan inside and all that stuff, bush kind of furniture and stuff. So I walked in, sat down, made myself comfortable, and this man kept walking back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he was introduced to me, Joel Silver, the producer, and he comes up to me and he looks at me and says, hey, kid, you know what? I got a place for you. I got a movie for you. I want to do a movie about boxing. But before I do that, I've got another movie in the jungle. You look like you belong there. How about being in this movie? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you famous. I discovered you. Just like every other producer I've met right over the past 15 years, they discovered me. I said, sure, sure, sure. I'll do this movie for you, right? So that's how I'm here. You're hit. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. In there? I play a guy in this by the name of Sergeant Blaine, and Sergeant Blaine is a 250-pound, shall I say, killer who chews tobacco. Bunch of slack-jawed faggots around here. This stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus, just like me. Oh, Jesse was a hoot. He came on very big, and it took us a little while to calm him down and get him closer to real. <laughs> this movie was dominated by larger-than-life personalities. John! Over here. Bill is a spectacular actor. He's a ringer in the group. I had worked for Joel previously in a film uh, entitled Commando, and we had a good time on that. Oh! Arnold and I got along real well. You scared, motherfucker? Well, you should be, because this Green Beret is going to kick your big ass. I ate Green Berets for breakfast. He liked that, and so uh, he hired me. My character has a, uh, a fair amount of emotionalism that I have to, to bring out. Oh, mother of God. The environment that we're in lends itself so dramatically to the actual uh, jungle experiences that I had when I was in Vietnam. And it was just a, an instant deja vu. I've had a number of those. Billy, you know something. What is it? There's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. Sonny was a hoot. The insurance company wouldn't let us hire him unless we got him, got a bodyguard for him. Now, the bodyguard was not to protect Sonny. The bodyguard was to protect other people from Sonny. So we had this six foot, eight inch tall giant man who just had to follow Sonny around 24 hours a day the entire time he worked in the movie and make sure that Sonny never misbehaved. <laughs> Your money bags are getting in uh, my shot there. <laughs> <laughs> the old woman in the village crossed themselves and whispered crazy things, strange things. El diablo cazador de hombres. The demon who makes trophies of man. I never say a word to El Video because her own intuitions are so good. She knows much more about the character than I do. El Pity is a surprise. A delightful one. And go back up, Shane. See if you can get your head square out so you can look straight down. Predator was sort of concurrent with this other movie that I had done, Lethal Weapon, that I'd written. So does it look like blood? Joel had asked me, do you want to do a draft of Predator? The studio's scrambling, and they'd like to kind of uh, uh, get a different, different version. I didn't want to, but he said, well, you just come down to Mexico with us anyway. We'll put you in the movie. So the idea was hatched. We'll hire him as an actor. And when he's there, stuck in Mexico, we'll give him the script and we'll make him rewrite it. So he cooked up a story and dropped the six of us in a meat grinder. He did nothing on the script. It turns out what the studio did, as they always do, is they took the original draft and just shot that. They go all the way around the circle, they get seven different writers to do a version, and then they'll go back to the original draft. Well, all the way through this, I was stealing a Robert Altman technique of if you can get actors who can bring something to the table, and then turn him loose. I keep my mouth shut about it, but I actually came from theater. So I like actors. Studio executives think that what they want was guys who love cars and guns and stuff like that. We gotta get a guy who loves cars and guns to do an, quote, action movie. So I would sort of hide the fact that I maybe ever knew anything about actors or that I liked them or anything like that. I, Cars and guns, love cars. It was one thing that John McTiernan was real on target with in regards to bringing us down here a week prior, and it helped out immensely. We brought in a military trainer with them. Oh, we had uh, Gary Adolph Goldman. I nicknamed him Adolph. It was a typical training for the way that Army soldiers move in the jungle, the way they deliver hand signals to one another. 
Joel said, hey, Bill, how would you like to go down and spend eight weeks in Puerto Vallarta? And we thought, oh, this will be cool. We'll go learn to be like soldiers, kind of move like soldiers. Actually, it was kind of miserable and awful, and I got bee stung, and I got this and that. So their rehearsal period was, see you guys, you report to the truck in the morning, we're driving you 20 miles out, and you walk back. Gary really, uh, uh, in my mind, made a lot of things work that weren't in script necessarily but we had a real feeling and a sense of camaraderie and what we were after and also a sense of the how to do you know with a really realistic uh, selection of guns and a really good weapons advisor and a good military advisor um, you know it lent an additional sense of realism we had to take in one week and teach these guys how to make themselves look like combat veteran special forces soldiers Jesse was a Navy SEAL he didn't need the training he cakewalked through the training because he's such a tough guy you know I'll put it this way I wouldn't want to go in real with these guys but I'll definitely do a film with them I know Jesse Jesse voiced that opinion a couple of times I don't agree with that First morning I was there, Arnold says, hey, we're going to go to the gym and work out. There was a subtle sort of competition, I think. Get up at 4 in the morning because you want that pump, but you don't want the other guys to see you getting that pump because when you walk onto the set, you know, and you look that good, it's got to be natural. You can't work out that hard. You know, nobody does. Uh, God just blessed you, you know. And so at 5.30 in the morning, Arnold's knocking on my door going, get up, get up. We're going down to work out. And they would run for an hour and a half. Just run. The hill is a port of art. So I get up, go downstairs with them to work out, and they proceed to torture me. They work out for another 20, 30 minutes. They eat breakfast and get on the bus and go up into the interior. Arnold's going, more reps, more, more, more. You know what I mean? He goes, what are you, a wussy? Pick up that weight. After we finished work, they would come back, I'm not exaggerating, and run another hour and work out for another hour eat and then go to bed. Every once in a while, you know, you'd walk in there, of course, and there'd be another guy or two guys over in the corner <laughs> pushing some iron, and, you know, you, I did it a couple of times. You know, I walked in there and said hi to them and looked around and said, what are you guys doing? And, wow, man, you guys are really working hard. And walk out, <laughs> go find a place to get some coffee, wait till they're gone, and then go in after they're gone, you know. Give nothing away. Give nothing away. Well, two hours later, I couldn't move. I was completely unable, stiff, whatever. But not been more pain in my life. Um, Arnold was taking great pleasure from this. The biggest thrill for me was when we hit wardrobe, and I happened to view Arnold's wardrobe tape, and when my arms taped out one inch bigger than Mr. Olympia's, that made Jesse Ventura feel pretty good. Well, I'm very happy about that, because then my choke worked. Because I told the wardrobe department they should tell him that. So I can bet him a bottle of champagne afterwards when he comes to the gym. He came to the gym two days later and he says, you know something, Arnold? We should measure our arms. Who has bigger arms? I said, of course, we should. I said, let's bet a bottle of champagne. He says, of course, we should. And then we measured it and my arm was three inches bigger than his. What the fuck? And he lost a bottle of champagne. So, I mean, you know, the psychotric trips, uh, they work on everybody, and bodybuilders and also on wrestlers. It was good. Seen some badass bush before, man, but nothing like this. I hear ya. This shit's something. Makes Cambodia look like Kansas. Well, in an action movie, geography is tremendously important. Physical proximity or physical relationship is, is often at the center of, of, of a physical conflict. We've spent whole days working on hillsides that were, you know, like this. Oh, and I'm still walking around with a nearly broken wrist. Um, I was climbing looking for a camera position, and the tree I was on <laughs> broke and dropped me on my head. I think if you check with some of the other publicity people, you'll find there's a picture of the director sticking in a pile of rotten roots with his legs up, and that's it. The physical thing every day, there's no... You don't find yourself even sitting down. I mean, we had to prop this chair up so I could sit straight, right? Standing, you can't stand anywhere that's flat. It's always on an angle on a hillside. So even between the shots, you still have to, you know, it's still tension, it's always tension. Visually, you've, you've got to create that whole environment that will put people a little on edge. It's a major minefield, and Don guided me through the minefield. I will be forever in his debt for that. All the uh, accoutrements of gripping equipment and lighting and all the rest of it have had to be hauled up and down hills endlessly. 
actually very, very heavy real jungle is cinematically not very interesting because you can't see anything. You know, your, your horizon ends at about four feet. We would wind up going through and trimming out leaves, not doing any damage, trimming out leaves so that you could see through at some distance. If you look at Predator just as a design of a film, it's extremely well designed. We've had to use the environments that, that John and uh, the producer selected for us and, and basically make those work. And we've had to build some trees. We've built four or five uh, trees out of styrofoam and fiberglass to try and get some of the scale uh, back into the jungle, some of the, the big root systems and the, uh, the, just the large trees that you don't find in these areas. Shooting the raid on the guerrilla encampment was a long, meticulous process. It's just so brilliantly done. I mean, that was a, one of the classic action scenes, one of the first and one of the big action scenes. We killed one of the hostages. We move. Mac, Blaine, the nest. Billy, Buncho, the guard, Hawkins, Dylan, back up. As soon as they're set, I hit the field dump. Yeah, the challenge for me was conceptually. Uh, as far as the scope of the stunts, to what magnitude. Every stunt's been done, every application has been done. To me, it was uh, come up with something new. gonna have to teach me how to patrol through a jungle nobody's gonna have to teach me how to take a sentry out and nobody's gonna have to teach me how to fire the most awesome weapon handheld the world has ever seen Jesse had that huge Gatling gun which makes so very little sense I think it fires somewhere around the range of three oh, right in there. Three to five thousand rounds a minute. When this thing went, it was like the people were all set with their cameras, but no one took a picture because it was like, and they all just stood there. The cameras came down, the mouths dropped open. It was like everyone just. And that's a cut. Put him out. That's a cut. Sergeant. Sergeant. Who get us today? I don't know. I only saw one of them camouflaged. We never really saw the Predator, and that's the wonderful, one of the wonderful things about that movie. I mean, we saw, even when my character is shooting and the arm goes off and all that sort of stuff, what my character saw was this, this sort of apparition that looked like the plants, but he saw the movement. When you design for visual effects, there are many more parameters that have to be considered than just the camera in action. We have a, a red suit that uh, he runs around in, in the jungle with, and we pull mats off of it. The full camouflage effect, which is made up of a bunch of concentric inlines, we call them. They'll be the film that created the Predator, the background, and what's inside the Predator. We're also doing the heat vision that it uses to see. So that the audience doesn't just see heat, which is kind of a disorienting uh, image, we are shooting a uh, regular color film of the background and also uh, a heat image all at the same time and then combining them together later uh, optically. So in order to do that, both cameras have to see from the same perspective, which we accomplish with a beam splitter so that the audience knows what they're looking at and yet at the same time you can see a very startling uh, and spooky image of what the predator uh, sees. So that then when those glasses come down, you're real close to the camera, actually. Okay. We have uh, a lovely little guy who comes to us from the optical house in New York. He takes measurements of everything, and, and the angles and this and that, and the, uh, you know, he's got a protractor alongside the camera and a, a surveyor's transit, and he checks absolutely everything and says, no, you can't shoot that, you can't shoot that. And he runs up and measures this and measures that. Uh, and three hours later, he says, all right, maybe you can try it. And that requires sometimes uh, as I, six hours to shoot one three-second cut. We had to go off and start shooting the movie, and the, uh, 
They had been, they were late to turning out the Predator, and uh, we were all desperately anticipating. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's, it's here today, no, tomorrow, 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 finally, the day it arrived. And they took the, the crowbars and pried it open and opened it and, and, and lifted it out of the box, and we all looked at each other and said, oh, are we in trouble. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if you shoot it from a low angle up, it would look bigger, you know? It just was kind of, like, underwhelming. The original Predator was not the Predator that you saw. The original Predator was a red figure with one eye in the middle on kind of stilts that on wires and so on. I just remember standing there and looking across through the trees, and there's this giant red thing coming like this. <laughs> like just exactly what we had not been trying not to have because it was impossible to move and it was terrible. I shot a shot, two shots with the damn thing and just sent it back to the studio saying, you really don't want us to continue with this, do you? And they looked at it and said, nope, <laughs> wait, stop. We knew the production was going to have to shut down when we ran out of money. Um, and it was one of those fortunate things that Larry Gordon was on board as a producer because um, he was there to protect the financial integrity of the picture. In other words, he was there to beat somebody up to get us more money, which wasn't going to happen for a period of time because it needed Leonard Goldberg to come, and he took over the studio. He followed Larry in. He saw the movie and saw the potential of the movie, saw an hour of the movie, and okayed the funds to finish the picture. A break in shooting like that is actually a tremendous... <laughs> Uh, luxury, it's wonderful. Uh, Woody Allen now does it as, the, as part of his production process. He shoots most of the movie and then goes and edits it. And then he goes and finishes, but also reshoots the things that, now that he's had a chance to, to work with it in the cutting room to see what he can do better and digest it. And what I wanted to do was put the movie together first and then go back. Uh, it's by no means a calamity. It's actually a, uh, it's an advantage. It gave us an opportunity to see the picture. And, you know, I think that that really affected the end of the movie because I think it was made bigger and more exciting and, and spectacular. And it's always great to be able to shoot the third act of a movie, knowing what the really strengths and weaknesses of the first two acts are. And then we went to Stan Winston. It was wonderful. Uh, you're probably wondering why we brought you here today. Basically, what we're doing is making monsters. That's what we do, and we do it well. Stan had just done this before, and he knew how to go about it, and, and it was just a, a very different experience working with him. Joel Silver uh, contacted me, and then I met with John McTiernan, and if I recollect, I believe it was Arnold that uh, recommended that they contact me. Uh, because, of course, Arnold and I had uh, worked together on The Terminator and have remained very close friends ever since. What the hell are you? The creature de design evolved uh, given the springboard of the Rastafarian warrior that uh, I had seen the drawing of that uh, Joel had had on an airplane flying to Japan with Jim Cameron sitting next to me. And uh, while I was on this uh, airplane flight uh, to Japan, I was sketching concepts for the Predator. Jim Cameron looked over to me and says, you know, I always wanted to see something with mandibles. And I went, oh, really? Well, so what? I think Stan Winston gave the Predator um, a great look. He came up with that unique hair design, came up with those jowls. He really created an indelible monster. He was going to be a warrior and a, you know, an, a humanoid, muscled out uh, warrior. And uh, guys in the studio had known of Kevin Peter Hall and was just finishing work, suit work, on Harry and the Hendersons at the exact same time. And I believe Kevin was somewhere on the, the seven foot range. Immediately the concept became, let's get Kevin who can in fact work in a suit who is an actor, who can create a performance, can create a character. And here is a guy who is huge. And next to Arnold would make Arnold look like a peanut. I saw them go by with this big mattress. They were in the Kevin's room. 
So you could have two big queen-size beds, and he just slept across both of them because he was so big. And he wasn't just a, some big guy in costume. I mean, the way he moved and the menace, and he took things off, you know. I, I, I just thought he was totally brilliant. The design of this Predator is really wonderful, and uh, the concept of the character and hunting and the hunting down Arnold is fun. So there's already the incentive to get into it because you know you're going to be going after Arnold Schwarzenegger. But on top of all of that, there's creating a personality that the audience can relate to. You know, because without it, then it's just something from somewhere else. Whereas this is a real conflict, and it's real important in this movie that the audience get a sense of who Arnold is and a sense of this evil force that is chasing him down. Because he suffered so long in the damn suit, I had to make sure that he got his face actually on screen. What the? I've always wanted to play a heavy, and this is an excellent heavy. <laughs> it kills for pleasure. He will skin the lion! It hunts for sport. He's killing us one at a time. No! But this time... If it bleeds, we can kill it. It's picked the wrong man to hunt. Ah! Arnold Schwarzenegger, Predator. Rated R, now playing in theaters everywhere. I saw it in a the theater in Westwood opening night uh, premiere, and it was like people were cheering. People loved the movie. And it did really well, and it had a really big opening night. Um, it was the number one film that weekend. My mother walked out. Now, and it's funny, my mother didn't walk out during uh, all, those, all the pussy jokes. You know, she, she was not offended, but she couldn't, when my character ran into the jungle and she knew that I was about to get killed, she couldn't watch, she had to leave. I believe the original budget of the movie was $18 million. Um, when you look back, that's not a lot of money because an action movie today, if you can do it for $50 million, you've done a great job. The official tab on this movie is that it is lost more than its original cost. Well, I gotta be honest. Um, I got a net points check. Um, about two weeks ago from the studio on the movie, so it seemingly has broke even. We had no idea that the film would be so well-remembered 15 years later. To this day, all the things I've ever done, people talk about, just today, I was, I was talking to some guys, and, and one of the business guys uh, was talking about, he had met me, he says, Predator. I mean, the first thing he said, I mean, he doesn't say Bill Duke. He says, Predator. The strength of those characters is what draws us back. There's something about the characters that resonate for us. And, you know, 15 years later, I guess those characters still resonate for a lot of people. I don't think the idea is dead, even. They did a sequel, of course. You still see Predator t-shirts. It's, it's a classic. It set a standard. You're one ugly motherfucker. I'm not going to say that. All right.